Hello folks, you're very welcome to another episode of the Grand Owl History on Celtic Fanzine TV and on audio also on the Celtic Soul podcast. Before we kick off, if you're watching or listening on YouTube, please hit the subscribe and notification button so you never miss an episode. And if you like what you're hearing, you might like to hit the like button too. And I'd like to say special thanks to Nave Park Celtic Supporters Club in Dublin for the continued support of both the podcasts, Salic Fanzine TV and indeed the Fanzine and for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. And if you're in Dublin, pop into the Badass Cafe if you want to watch a match with the lads when they're not on the big bus on the way to Glasgow. And folks, on the show today, I'm joined by author and retro fanzine editor of The Shamrock, Paul McQuaid. And um, if you enjoyed this conversation, check out my conversation with Paul. We had a two-parter on the Celtic Soul podcast during lockdown when we did speak about the subject of today also. And that's available across all the platforms on the podcast. You can get them all at Celtic Fanzine. T- oh, sorry. You can get them all at CelticFanzine.com as well and on Celtic Fanzine TV. Paul joins me today to talk about his new book, Celtic Daft, the Johnny Doyle story, and to give and to give us an insight into the life and career of Johnny, who lived the dream of every die-hard Celtic fan when he pulled on the famous green and white hoops of Celtic. Paul McQuaid, you're very welcome back onto the podcast, and firstly, congratulations on the book. I've really enjoyed reading it, and I'm going to give it a bit of a plug. Here it is, folks. Brilliant cover, brilliant book, and uh, I read it on my holidays. Uh, I'm still a little bit to go, Paul, but absolutely brilliant. Really loved it. Um, written from the heart, I think, and um, you'd know it was written by a fan, about a fan, um, because you get that you get that lovely feel when you read the book. Um, but look, he, he was he was a player that pulled on the famous green and white hoops, as I said, a fan. Um, so before we, uh, I suppose, kick off, I just want to say I am not blown blowing smoke up your ass Paul um, <laughs> but it is it is really good it's a fantastic read but Fossey can you give the, the viewers and the listeners a quick insight into yourself and your contribution to Celtic fan- fandom outside the book okay yeah no problem Andrew um, yeah this is the this is the fourth book I've done now um, I've had a connection with Johnny Doyle going back a, a few years. Um, Johnny died on what was my 11th birthday. Um, and then over time, I got involved with a couple of supporters' organisations, um, involved with a Johnny Doyle banner. That was about 15 years ago, probably longer. Uh, and a booklet as well. Got to meet the family. So I met his daughter, Joanna. I met his son, Jason, and his sister, Anne-Marie. Um, and then in the last four or five years um, I launched the the Shamrock so that's focusing a uh, magazine focusing on Celtic's history um, and then did a couple of books starting with the Invincible season and then the Coronation Cup um, and then probably two and a half three years ago um, Jana mentioned to um, Brendan my pal Brendan Sweeney that she was looking to see if somebody would write a book and Brendan had recommended me um, and then we just started talking about it from there and then from from agreeing to do it it probably took about just over two years start to finish um, but the big advantage was I had access to the Doyle family's archive um, large number of scrapbooks photo albums huge number of newspaper clippings as well um, and from that principally from that um, I was able to put together the story from there you know um, but Joanna had made it clear that what she was looking for was to get an understanding of um, the relationship between her dad and the Celtic support and how the Celtic support still clung on to him after all these years it's 40 years uh, this year since he passed away um, and just to try and get to the heart of what that relationship was like and why it survived for so long as well so she wanted as much fan input as was really possible you know um, so that was one of the key requirements if you like um, and that was that was pretty straightforward because um, because of the connection that Johnny had with so many indi- individual Celtic fans it was really just about trying to make contact get those memories uh, written down from people um, and dozens and dozens of people were sharing them um, within a matter of a few weeks you know um, so yeah really getting the best of them putting the stories together and uh, matching up with his life story uh, his family story as well um, 
and um, it was a joy because there's so many amazing stories about Johnny Doyle. A lot of them you really need to pinch yourself to make sure that they're true, you know. Um, in many respects, a controversial figure, certainly by today's standards, less so in the 1970s. Um, so it was fascinating. It was hugely enjoyable. It was a lot of work, but it was hugely enjoyable. Things about his life, his early life in View Park, his time at Air United was really interesting. And then his, his time at Celtic was an absolute roller coaster. Incredible highs and lows, you know in the uh, the six years he was a Celtic player. Underlining all of that was a guy who was a Celtic fan pretty much from birth. His father was a massive Celtic fan. The Doyles are a huge Celtic family in View Park as well. Um, So he was always a supporter. And that's something that everybody knew about Johnny Doyle when he played for air. He always talked about Celtic in interviews, any chance he got. And then even on the pitch, it was always quite clear. Uh, he always his heart was always at Celtic Park. Two years, it's it's a long time. Um, when you're getting on with your life, I suppose the lockdown helped a little, did it? It did actually. It did. It made a, a few things a little bit harder in terms of accessing the newspaper libraries. Um, but there's a lot of newspapers online now. You know, a lot of services that you can access. Um, also, as well as all the families information and they had they've got some great stuff like letters from fans that they'd kept a um, lot of interviews that I couldn't find elsewhere um, from magazines and newspapers and um, Brendan my pal Brendan again he gave me access to his um, Celtic View collection um, for the, the years that Johnny was a Celtic player and that was tremendous because it took a long time to go through them but it proved really worthwhile you know found out some some real nuggets in there um, the best one, I think, was about a year after Johnny joined Celtic, uh, The View ran a wee piece, just a small piece about um, The View Park Celtic Supporters Club and how when they started, um, around about 1968, I think it was, January 68, um, their first ever, first ever game that they ran a bus to was a friendly against Newcastle United, down in Newcastle, and Johnny was on the bus that day. Um so that was great finding out stuff like that, you know. And um, this is two years before he became a professional footballer. Um, but then there was lots of stories within the family information, but also in interviews as well, you know, where he talked about his earliest um, Celtic memories and how he had actually decided not to become a footballer because he was already a member of the supporters club. He'd already given them the subscriptions for the season. And he was obviously watching at this point in time 65 to 69 probably the greatest Celtic team of all time you know so he was loving it so it took a lot to persuade him to, to give that up and to actually give professional football a go yeah and if I, if, if I push forward here to the start of the book but it's actually it, the last picture of, of Johnny and I, th- mm. I think it sums him up because it's taken from I'm just looking at the book here it's taken from the Tranmere Hotel Tran at East Lodian on Saturday the 17th of October 1981 and it's a picture of Johnny with another fan another two fans uh, one is the fan um, is a Zeki Ingle Zeke Zeke Ingle Zeke, apologies to Zeke Zeke Ingle <laughs> and the other fan is in fact a fan who also got lucky on water jersey and it's Tommy Bones and it's a fantastic picture but it's also very sad that it's the last picture of such a young yeah, man. Absolutely. Such a young, young man. Yeah. 30 years old. So that picture was taken on the Saturday night. Johnny died on the Monday night in his house. Um, and that was them visiting the Haddington, uh, Musselburgh number one, I think it was. Um, sports club out in the east, along the coast from Edinburgh on the east side. Um, Johnny, Tommy Burns and Bobby Lennox uh, were the players who attended the Play of the Year dance. And uh, it was actually Zeke's pal had the camera with him that night, you know, um, and got a photo of Tommy and Johnny and Zeke and Tommy and Johnny with himself. And it was great. That was one of the things that we shared with the uh, with Joanna. We set up a Facebook page. I was probably about seven or eight years ago because we, we used to run a website called johnnydoll.com and we kept it as a Facebook page. And so every... You know, every anniversary and then in between people we would share things about them. And that was one of the things that I went back and rediscovered. And then I was looking at the dates as well and something that Zeke could say. And I thought, there's every likelihood that that would be the last photo that was taken. 
of Johnny, you know, just two days before he died. Um, and there he is with one of his best friends, another absolute Celtic legend, Tommy Burns as well. And as you say, it's just a great photo. And it's um, it actually, in the end, it came as no surprise, you know, that because David Province said Johnny Doyle was out there every weekend um, at Celtic supporter dues, you know, supporter nights, play the year dances, functions. He, he loved it. And that's that's been backed up by what I've found as well. You know, that's, I think, the main reason why so many people remember Johnny is because they met him and he left such a firm impression on them, you know, by either just being a funny guy, telling them stories, spending time with them, giving them gifts, um, shorts, socks after games and what have you. Um, fan from Coatbridge shared with me how it was actually Tom, Johnny and Tommy again came to their youth club um, play of the year dance and he was messing around. It's a photo of Johnny with his, uh, his mum and his aunt, all the women who were there cooking the food for them that night, cleaning up. Johnny helped them brush up at the end of the night. They got photos of that and he was just, you know, he was just such a, uh, a lovely guy. That's the impression that so many people had of him because he spent his time his free time, he gave it up to spend in the company of other Celtic fans. And Tommy Burns, as we know, was very similar. Uh, they were more than happy to do that. Um, and that's, I think, where a lot of the, the Johnny Doyle legend and the continuing connection comes from. There's so many Celtic fans that have got stories like that. Yeah, and for our younger uh, viewers and, and listeners, um, Celtic players used to turn up on a weekly basis at supporters' functions. Um, I can't see it happening too much now. But in the book, yeah. it also says, I think it's it's Davy Hay says that he was going to Aberdeen, which is which is a long spin from Glasgow, to attend a, a supporters' function. Johnny hadn't got a supporters' function on that weekend, and he went too. So he he, he that's just right, that's right. he just loved it, didn't he? Yeah, he, he, absolutely. You know, he said he said that that's from the that was from the documentary that the Celtic TV did on the twenty fifth anniversary. He said, uh, um, "I've not got anything on this weekend. I'll come up with you." <laughs> all the way to Aberdeen. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was south of Scotland, along the west coast as well, you know. He went all over the shop. Um, and I think because he he knew how much it meant to people, you know, to be in the company of a Celtic player, it meant a lot to him as a young guy. And interestingly, when his father had the accident that nearly killed him, uh, when Johnny was just, Johnny and his sister were about six, seven years old, um, he was visited in hospital by Bobby Evans, um, the Celtic captain at the time, you know. And that was something that the Doyle family talked about for years. So I think Johnny had a personal appreciation of what it meant for people to be in the company of Celtic players, you know. And he just he just seemed to love being in company as well. Um, Bobby Evans would have been, the, I suppose, the superstar of, of that team. Absolutely. His father's hero by all accounts as well, you know. And um, we think it was through a relation, got in contact with the club. Johnny's dad was in hospital in Glasgow for over a year, and that's when the, the visit was arranged. Yeah, um, I don't want to give too much away uh, from the book because, um, you know, even early in the book, I was getting, um, and not emotional, but I was saying, God, if, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it was a hard journey to get to um, yeah. where he was, and there's like, there's, there's absolutely brilliant stuff about him playing, like the boys playing as kids and teenagers and the players yeah. that came from View Park. You know, <laughs> Incredible. So, and it wasn't just Jimmy Johnson either. So I won't give it, I won't give it all away, but <laughs> I tell you one thing, some of the players playing with Celtic now would struggle to get onto that Ashfield Park. It was, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's incredible. It, um, it was incredible. One person who, yeah, it really was. I mean, one person who, helped me out, and it was just, got an email address for him over in the States, Ian Monroe, um, former Hibs manager, Scottish internationalist, played for uh, St Mirren, played for Rangers for one season. So he's from View Park. Um, he's, I think, nearly two years older than a wee guy who lived along the street from him, went to the same school, John Robertson. They used to play football together in front of where their school was, uh, between a set of trees. Trees are still there, is bus terminus in View Park um, and Ian was giving me all these insights into street football 
Um, but he's still a big advocate of he still coaches over in the United States now. Um, he was tremendous, you know. But again, ordinary fans, um, my pal Frank, who's in the Graves Society, he's from View Park, he played against Johnny, he had some great stories as well, you know. Um, but football was such a big thing and they, there were so many players of such good standards in that one small town um, who made it all the way. Um, and that's why this incredible record, you know, three European Cup winners' medals, View Park lays claim to. And um, two of them belong to a Celtic assistant manager, and another one's Jimmy Johnson. It's, it's incredible, and it's funny when you do read books that when when they go back and they talk about, there's always, you know, there's always someone from the area that made it too. Because I, I remember um, doing a doing a night with Ray Houghton, the the Liverpool yeah. and, and Irish international uh, Glasgow boy, and he was saying that Glasgow boy. Yeah, the 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 tenements he came out of, or the flats came out of, the Frank and Eddie Gray came out of them as well. Like you know, so you yeah. know, not 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 to, there was there's so much talent in, in in Glasgow, like throughout Glasgow. So, and every time you you speak to a player, they will they will name somebody may not play for Celtic, but they will name someone that they that came from the area or they played along with. So yeah. long tradition, and I suppose it is football and and boxing. I suppose they're a way of people getting out of. Um, I, you know, getting out of our area, and, and you know, it's a way out if you've got the talent to yeah, a, to a absolutely. better life. Because you know, we all know that um, areas we come from. That if you can get a break in music or football, if you don't have an education, it's a great way to get out of get out of you know get just get yourself up the ladder. Yeah, Ian Monroe said to me, "View Park is famous for two things: football and murder." Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to, um, I'd like to say sorry on behalf of Paul if anyone from View Park is offended, listening or watching. Um, <laughs> and do go down and look at the Jimmy Johnson statue. Yes, <laughs> Paul, but uh, Paul. As I said, I don't want to give loads away in the book, but can you just tell us something about um, Johnny, the, the fan? Yeah, um, it's one of the things I wanted to, to find out was. It's often said, you know, about footballers, especially Celtic players, you know, being big fans. I think it's a bit harder nowadays because a lot of your modern footballers um, will have been playing football on weekends regularly from age five or six, you know. So actually getting to games is quite difficult, even if you're a football fanatic. Um, so that's often the claim, you know, huge Celtic fan and what have you. So I just wanted to just see how true that was in Johnny's case, you know. And... Um, there's just so much evidence, you know, from an early age. Because um, he, he talked in interviews about how his first Celtic Rangers game, he went to Ibrox. Now, View Park, I think, is um, six miles away from Celtic Park. You know, so it's out the east of Glasgow. It's just on the outskirts of Glasgow. It's not far. Um, but Johnny, uh, aged about, I think this is 63, thereabouts, um, aged about eight years old, and a group of half a dozen pals made their way into Glasgow, over to Ibrox Park, uh, went in the Rangers end, because the majority of his pals he was with were Rangers fans, um, and w- watched the game, the first ever um, Celtic Rangers game, uh, in the Rangers end. Um, and unfortunately, there was, a, there was a, a very serious crush at the game that day. Uh, two Rangers fans lost their lives. And this meant panic back in View Park when Johnny Doyle's wife, eh, sorry, his mum found out from neighbours that actually Johnny was at the game. So he told his mum he was going to see a game at Fur Park that day in Motherwell, which he was obviously a lie. She found out he lied. She found out that he wasn't back. So as you can imagine, there was all sorts of things uh, going through her mind. And then finally he turned up back with his pals and she barred him, <laughs> she barred him for lying to her as well. You know? So he all loved telling the story. Yeah. That's in about four different interviews he tells that story. He's first ever Celtic Rangers game. Um, so there's a wee hint of tragedy there as well, you know. Um, so that, like, from an early age, but before that, you know, his father, um, big Celtic fan from a big family himself. So we did a wee bit of, um, thanks to one of Joanna's friends, she'd already done some family history on the Doyles, you know, so we are able to trace them all the way back to Central Island. Um, and mostly based around initially Bells Hill, Huddingston, and then settled in View Park over the last hundred years or so. Um, and Celtic fans from an early an early stage as well, unsurprisingly, minors. Um, so Johnny's dad was the 
third generation of miners um, in the Lanarkshire area um, from the Doyle family. Um, so, yeah, hardcore Celtic fans, um, regular attenders at the game as well. And so Johnny's dad, so even after they had the accident, Johnny's dad broke his back in an accident down the mines. So that's why he was in the hospital for a year. He was then, they were unable to get him back home there to move to a new house and in View Park uh, to be able to get him out, ground floor flat. Um, but he actually was able to get a, an Invercar, one of the old mobility cars, um, which he was able to use. So that gave them a bit of freedom. He was only meant to be in it himself, but both Johnny and Anne Marie would regularly get taken for runs in this wee car. And so one time we dad took him to a Celtic Rangers game at Celtic Park in the wee Invercar. But he got knocked back. To, there weren't any spaces left for more disability cars, so they didn't get in that day, you know. Um, Anne Marie, his sister, has a tremendous memory of um, when his father's in the wheelchair and he's encouraging Johnny to become two footed, right? Because he was heavily relying on his right foot. Um, and he would, so he would stand and he would hold his right foot, his dad from the wheelchair, and encourage him to practice the ball with his left foot. You know, um, there were football, absolutely football daft and Celtic daft. So he had that instilled from him in an early age. There was one interview he did with Jerry McNeed. Jerry McNeed's quite an important figure in Johnny's story because they had a connection from fairly early on. It worked, worked well for both of them. Um, Jerry McNeed would promote the fact that Johnny was unhappy at air, uh, unhappy the way, the, the way that the air board were treating him and trying to help him get a move either out or preferably to Celtic. So Jeremy McNeil was regularly writing about that. In return, Johnny Doyle gave him a promise that if anything came off it, he would be the first to know. So that's how he ended up um, when finally, after long drawn-out negotiations, Celtic met Air United's asking price uh, late on a Sunday night. Johnny got up five o'clock in the morning, went to local phone box. He was living in a council flat in View Park at the time. Um, phoned Jerry McNeil's house to tell him, I'm signing for Celtic in Glasgow Airport in three hours. So McNeil got the story before anyone else. Um, and after that, Jerry McNeil would regularly do profiles on Johnny. And even after his death, he did a couple of interviews with Johnny's, Johnny's widow as well. Um, but one of the things that Johnny talked about often in those interviews is the fact that his prized possession was this wee Celtic shield that he'd inherited from his father, just a supporter shield, you know, just like the club crest. Um, but he, he had it all of his days as well. So again, the Celtic connection was there right from the start. Um, after that first trip to Ibrox, uh, his mum would only let him go to football games in the company of his aunt and uncle. So that's what he did um, with his aunt and uncle. He took him on the bus. Uh, this is before the few bark CSE started. Um, they took him on another supporters bus and he travelled all over Scotland watching the Lisbon Lions as it turned out. Um, and Anne Marie was also able to tell me about how they spent the 25th of May 1967 in their pal's house, about six or seven of them, uh, watching the game live from Lisbon as well. Johnny went outside afterwards practising real football, <laughs> trying to emulate his heroes in the back garden as well. So it was great being able to get all these wee stories and then just trying to fit them all in together, you know, trace his, his history as a Celtic fan. Paul, is, is this the fourth book on Johnny Doyle? Yeah, yeah, no books about him before Incredible, this. It's isn't it, that it took so long? I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, he was at Celtic for six years, um, like, so more, probably more of a cult figure, you know? Yeah. Um, he probably never hit the heights as a Celtic player that he did when he was at Air United because that's where he got his international cap. And um, he was generally regarded as one of the, the fastest and best wingers in Scottish football, probably 73, 74, 75, you know. And he was in the Scotland under-23 squads um, and he got the one the one international cap against Romania. Um, but he probably didn't hit those heights and... Like I said, his time at Celtic was an absolute roller coaster. It's, it's incredible thinking back, you know. Um, when he joins, his debut gets injured. Uh, Celtic will lose the league title to Rangers, even though they were they were leading at that point. Um, Celtic do the double. Then they have the worst season in a couple of decades. Oh, sorry, after I that, just I just was, lost you there when you were talking to just a bit is roller coaster. Can you can you just give us a bit of that again? Yeah, no problem. Um so it was incredible up and down story because um in his, from his debut 
um, starts well, gets badly injured, puts him out of action for about a month, and in that time, Celtic falter. They were leading the league against Rangers. Falter, Rangers take over, win the league by the time Johnny comes back into the team. The next season, uh, Celtic win the league in cup double. The next season, Celtic are flirting with relegation, 7th, 8th, ninth position in the league, lose twice to Clyde Bank. Jock's team effectively resigns at the end of that season. Billy McNeil comes in win the league at the end of the next season. You know, so he's up and he's down and he's up. Um, gets the challenge from David Proven. David Proven's the big new signing. Takes his place on the, the right wing. And then Johnny's got to work really hard to get back into Billy McNeil's plans after that. And he does that by reinventing himself as a left winger, um, but moving across the front three as well. So he gives Billy McNeil other options. Um due in part to the fact that his father had insisted that he learned to play with both his right foot and his left foot all those years earlier. And that gives his new that gives his, his life at Celtic uh, a new uh, a new lifeline effectively in his Celtic career. Because from then he's a regular in the first team again. And then we have these tremendous moments against Real Madrid, um, his amazing performance at Love Street in the Cup against uh, St Mirren, um, the Cup final, uh, Hamden, the, the Riot final, and of course the 4-2 game, and then amongst all that as well. Unbelievable uh, sequence of events, you know. Um, and he was at the heart of all. Certainly a rollercoaster ride. You mentioned there his family. Um, where was his family originally from in Ireland? I think it's Ross Common. Um, certainly somewhere quite central in Ireland. Um, that's the Doyle side of it. But his mother's family were also uh, Irish as well, going back four generations, you know. Um, but I think it was Ross Common. Um, and, I mean, there's there's not much talk of, of Johnny talking about his Irish troops, but presumably it was something that he was aware of, you know. Um, it's probably something that should only become um, of interest to a lot of people in the last 20, 30 years. Um, in terms of trying to find out, okay, so where did the family come from originally? You know, if they don't have um, relatives who still come from there as well. Um, but as a large family of Doyle's in the View Park area, you know, so um, they wouldn't necessarily have had to have looked much further than that. Um, but again, no doubt about it, big Irish Catholic family, um, been in Lanarkshire by that point. By the point he was born, been in Lanarkshire for nearly 100 years, so obviously well settled in Scotland, you know. Yeah, and another big uh, Celtic man who was lucky enough to, to wear the jersey on many occasions and uh, sta- still stands in the terraces at 81 years of age and it's his birthday this week, so we'll have to wish a big happy birthday to the original holy goalie, John Fallon. But John Fallon. John has just got his Irish passport. He got it when he was eight years of age and he was on to me straight away and he he had a lot of work to try and get us sorted and... Uh, there's, there's good friends in Ballymena and they helped out. They came down to Dublin and they went through records and they found out, um, you know, where John's ancestors were from. And I think it was his, his grandfather, but there was a problem with a few bits and pieces and eventually he got it done. And he is a, he's such a happy man now to be an Irish passport holder and he's boasting about it. He'll be boasting about it outside the pool's office this week, no doubt. <laughs> Quite right, too. Quite right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's it, it, it's a lovely story with John, you know. And again, like 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 the other Johnny Johnny Doyle, he you know both you know would would, would give everything for to for the jersey. But it doesn't matter if they're playing or standing on the terraces or. And John's another one that comes from that generation of attending functions and still attending functions. He was over here um, in Belfast and Ballymena. And he, he visited everybody and he, he had the medal with him and Tommy Stevenson was with him with the European Cup and there was children from, you know, young children sure. and as, and then you had the likes of Duff and all the squad, all the older boys out with him. So it was, it was yeah. great to see after, you know, so long in lockdown and, you know, I think there's, exactly. I think there's like a, a positive vibe now around the club again because uh, oh, Ange, Ange Postacoglu has um, certainly... Certainly put a marker down, an early marker down after the disappointment of the Champions League and losing the first home game. And I think Kyogo could become another cult hero, just like Johnny. What a, what a player he seems to be. But yeah. it's early days Absolutely. yet. And I think last weekend he got a welcome to Scottish football by being stamped on and getting an elbow in the face. And uh, 
the right royal reverend beaten couldn't see anything, you know. <laughs> Three blind mice He's again. again. But anyway, listen, back to back to um <laughs> back to the book. Um it's it's a great story. Um I'm as I said, I'm really enjoying it. But like you've you've gone through there, you know, just just a brief outline of it and I think if any Shatlick fan gets the chance to get their hands on it they they really will enjoy it um, but when am I going to get on the um, walking tour <laughs> yeah the famous well, Celtic walking tour yes indeed we're looking to restart it now it's certainly possible um, at the moment um, I'm involved in another kind of walking tour though where um, I'm not doing the walk this time but the Grave Society is uh it's organising, as they did 10 years ago, um, a walk from Celtic Park to Carden in Fife because next month is the 90th anniversary of the passing of Johnny Thompson. Um, so it's it's a recreation of something that happened back in 1931. There was a large number of Celtic fans who wanted to attend the funeral um, but didn't have the money. Um, unemployment was particularly high at the time in the late 20s, early 30s. So hundreds of Celtic fans decided just to walk from the west of Scotland through to Fife and they camped in the uh, the hills above um, Carden Den um, so that they could be there. So that was the inspiration for us 10 years ago to organise a walk. Um, and we had about 30, 30 odd walkers 10 years ago. Um, so for the 19th anniversary, we've, we've just organised a similar event as well. Um, so that's happening in three weeks' time. So that's taking up a, a fair bit of time at the moment, just getting everything finalised for that, Andrew, you know. Um, but we're still getting people this week. Um, another five, I think, have signed up for it. Um, so... Um, leaving Celtic Park early on the Friday morning, um, walking um, to uh, Falkirk that first day, then on to Dunfermline the next day, and then through to Carden then on the, the Sunday. And Sunday happens to be the 90th anniversary itself of Johnny's death. So the Memorial Committee in Carden uh, have their annual graveside uh, commemoration, uh, which we're going to be there um, in time to take part with as well. And it looks as though all the restrictions are lifted for that. Because unfortunately last year it was only a handful of people who could attend. Supports clubs could only send single delegates um, as well. So it's great that um, for this really important commemoration um, that everything's pretty much back to normal, you know. And um, it's uh, it's a, another incredible thing to be involved with. So um, we're still promoting that at the moment. And as I said, still putting the, the final bits of organisation together for it as well. Well, Once that's out of the way. And I think there's another podcast episode in the Johnny Thompson story. Indeed, indeed, we've got Eddie and Jeanette and possibly the wee dog walking um, walking this year as well with us, you know. And I think the numbers are currently up about 35, um, which is tremendous. Um, so it's a, it's a big undertaking, you know, and we've highlighted the fact that people really need to get a lot of preparation in, um, because it's already walking probably about 54 miles all in uh, over the three days. But you get this fantastic um, commemoration of an absolute legendary Celtic figure at the end of it in the village where he grew up. Um, and that's always um, a great thing to be at, you know. Usually there's a football tournament um, for the uh, kids at Carden Den, but there wasn't enough time to organise that by the time the restrictions were lifted. So it's just a gravesite commemoration uh, this year and the walk. Oh, it'd be 54 miles in total, is it? Yeah, 54 miles. Yeah, oh, over, three, parts, over three days. Um, over three days. Oh my God. I, I'm getting tired thinking about it. That's why I'm not doing it this time. I'm, only for I'm not over, I do it myself. <laughs> we'll hold you to that in your next visit. I, listen, um, just back to the book. Who, uh, you mentioned there, uh, you know, that you got great access from the family. Who else contributed to the book? Um, I, again, through the family, I was able to get contact details. People that have always stayed in touch with them, you know, people who were always close to their dad, um, guys like Mick Conroy, a uh, Celtic colleague. Um, Mick was tremendous because um, I said to him, all, oh, you know, basically, what what's your favourite memories, you know, and I had a couple of questions for him. Uh, Mick came back with five pages of... Um, uh, general stuff about Johnny, but his own recollections of his very first day 
when he turned up at Celtic Park on his own. <laughs> and he met Johnny Doyle for the first time in the reserve training room, um, in the reserve dressing room, rather, um, because that would be a daily occurrence for Johnny Doyle to go into the reserve room <laughs> and noise every one of them up. Um, demand uh, that the Rangers fans who were in the Celtic Reserve squad sing Celtic songs. <laughs> he would query whether the, the Catholic players in the Reserve squad had been at Mass on the Sunday as well. <laughs> and um, ah, I'm about to lose my phone, Andrew, and power. I'm going to have to go and charge it. Go ahead, go on. You can pause. Yeah. Unbelievable, mate. And you won't be surprised to learn that the fucking cord's very short. Oh, Jesus Christ, right. Hold on. Right. I'm going to bounce it on a Johnny Doyle book for good measure. How's that? That's perfect, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, brilliant. So, where was I again? Sorry, I forgot what I was saying. Mike Conroy. Mike Conroy, oh. Tremendous. So Mick gave me this long written piece about that first day and it's just so I just put it in the book as it was, you know, because I thought people are going to be fascinated by this. Um, you know, a guy just turned up Mick's dad played for Celtic as well, you know, but he turns up Celtic Park on his own. First person he meets nearly mocking, you know, nearly directs him towards the reserve changing room. A couple of boys there he doesn't know, you know, so he's just getting ready. Door burst open. In comes Johnny Doyle. And he says from that on, the first thing he said to him, what team do you support? So you can imagine he was delighted when he told him, actually, my dad was a Celtic player back in the 50s, you know. Um, Mick's got very good Celtic credentials. So Mick was brilliant. Um, and I've seen other people, Ian Monroe, was tremendous. I was lucky because there was a lot of information already out there. So, for instance, George McCluskey. Um, now, George... George comes from a um, village just next to View Park, knows the Doyle family, the wider family as well, has done for most of his life. Um, but I didn't, I could have interviewed George, but I didn't need to, because I had about five pages of um, quotes from him about Johnny already, from his book. Uh, he's done regular interviews about Johnny as well, um, and loads of other things, you know, that I was able to put together from documentaries and stuff. Um, so got loads of information that way also. Um, but through the family, uh, made contact with Jim from Charlie and the Boys, got the whole story behind how he wrote the song Johnny Doyle because he was a personal friend of Johnny's and he, he met him just a couple of months. Last time he saw him just a couple of months before he died. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, and also Hugh, Rangers fan from Kilmarnock, um, who was a really good friend of Johnny's and who Johnny would regularly take um, with him to Celtic supporter functions um, and he would get Hugh tickets uh, for the big games uh, obviously involving Rangers so the 4-2 game uh, Hugh's there in the main stand watching Johnny get sent off <laughs> before it, he remembers when he was warming up Johnny was giving the Vickies to the Rangers fans along the front of the main stand as well Um Hugh also went with Johnny. Um, they drove up to the Hamden Riot Cup final together. Hugh thinks Johnny's partly responsible for causing the riot because his behaviour at the final whistle, even though he wasn't on the field to play, but he, he was on it pretty quickly. Um, so brilliant, you know. Anne Marie, Johnny's sister, fantastic um, source of information for the stories from the childhood, some of the family history as well. Um, but yeah, um, again, you know yourself, Joanna particularly has done so much in the last 15, 20 years um, to keep her father's legend alive. You know, Joanna's well known amongst the support. Um, and so Joanna had all these contact details herself. So Alessandro over in Italy, the guy who started the Italian Scout Supporters Club, he is a massive Johnny Doyle aficionado. Um, so again, I've got reams of information about how that started for Alessandro. How you would remember seeing Johnny uh, on the telly, uh, the game against uh, sorry, uh, the game against Real Madrid, uh, which was broadcast highlights were broadcast in Italy. Um, his dad was an Inter Milan fan, and um, he couldn't believe when his dad started telling him about this 
the Glasgow team that beat them, the European Cup. Nobody was expecting it back in 67. Um, and Alessandro uh, regularly comes over with other Italian fans um, for Johnny's commemorations. You know, he was over for the 30th, five years after that as well. They had a night in the brazen head about three years ago for Johnny. Um, so again, through uh, Joanna and the family, it was really quite straightforward to make contact um, with people um, who had stories to tell about Johnny. Fascinating. And, and when we had George McCluskey on the podcast and when I've done a couple of live shows with George, yeah, Johnny Doyle certainly gets mentioned. And um, that's another podcast if anyone's listening. Check out George's podcast because you get an insight into Johnny Doyle in that one and also the the cup final and the Rangers sending off on that. So definitely... Um, yeah. Worth we'll checking out George's one on that. Now, listen, where can we get the book? And I'll just hold it up again. So, there you go, people. Celtic Daft. Book's available from the Shamrock website, shamrock.net. It's also available from Calc Books as well. The finest bookshop in the East End of Glasgow. It certainly is. <laughs> um, and I, I hope there's going to be... Um, I hope we get you in. We're now talking... Uh, about getting Celtic AM back on the on the road again, uh, we've had a Brilliant. we've had a number of requests. Uh, we could be moving venue, but nothing is uh, nothing is concrete yet. But we hope to get back in September, and who knows, maybe we'll do a Johnny Doyle special and a book signing. Uh-huh. And we might make, maybe Joanna, really? who does the forward and the book, might come in, and maybe some fans who have stories and. and Sure, we'll be able to grab a player that played with Johnny as well because we done one for uh, about Jimmy Johnson oh, yeah. the evening before a Rangers match, and it was it's one of the most memorable, um, I suppose, Saturday wow. games we did because it was just to get, I suppose, a different view. You know, on on that one we done on Jimmy, we had Agnes in who was given the wife's view, oh. we had George McCluskey in yeah. who was given the, the players' view, and we had the boys in the Jimmy Johnson Academy who were given the legacy. Um, that you know of the team that's there now, and and we also had a few uh, a few fans with plenty of stories. And it's funny when it finished, when we when we were wrapped up, the amount of, the amount of stories that was going around the pub after yeah. that, and in, in pocket conversations was brilliant. So hopefully we can get do something like that for Johnny and remember Johnny Doyle. Definitely, Paul. Um, I'm sure the family would love it as well. I'll be, and you know, like we need to keep, especially for younger people, because uh, I never saw Johnny play, and I'm 50, and there's a generation yeah. after generation after me who who feel the same way as Johnny did about Celtic. So it would be great to, um, it would be great to pay tribute to him. And um, Paul, listen, thanks very much for coming on and sharing some of Johnny's story. As I said, I'm almost finished <laughs> the book, and there's a lot, there's a lot more in there for um, people yeah. to enjoy. Um, I'm looking forward to getting on that walking tour with you. I hope we get it done before uh, because uh, it's been a long COVID and it was a long, I was due to do it before COVID. So I think we're looking forward to doing it in the April and uh, that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I can say, Paul, is, is thanks very much. And folks, please hit the subscribe and notification button so you never miss an episode. And if you like what you're hearing and you like what you heard on this podcast, please hit the like button. Please visit our website, CelticFansy.com, where you'll find news, articles, all the podcasts and videos, information on upcoming events, because we are back in the event game. And uh, you can visit our online hey. shop where you can buy fanzines, subscribe, pick up T-shirts and some merchandise. And um, also visit the Shamrock website, which is, Paul, what is it? <laughs> it's uh, the Shamrock.net. And you'll be able to pick up the Giant Oil book, the other books, and of course, the, the brilliant retro fans in the Shamrock. And uh, one thing about Paul is when he posts stuff out, you always get a nice little picture of some stickers. He's quality, <laughs> quality stuff. Uh, I have to up my game now because uh, when I when I, when I got the book and the post, I was very impressed with the with the sticker cards and the lovely picture of uh, Tommy Bones. And I actually have the picture. I'm using it as a I'm using it for the pages in the book. And that's it, folks. Look, you get lovely. You can see a lovely pictures like really? that. It's a lovely postcard. And Paul puts so much time and effort into um, what he does. And, you know, Paul's not in it for profit. Paul's in it for the love of Celtic. So please support him as well. Um, because we do we, we do our best to uh, keep, I suppose, keep things taking over in the in the fanzine world and books. Absolutely. And 
we're lucky in we're lucky in the independent Celtic media that we've so uh, so many old codgers around now doing doing the keeping up with these young fellas <laughs> and and young girls. <laughs> So, folks, uh, as I Indeed. said, thanks for watching and listening. Um, and thanks again to Nave Park, Salic Supporters Club in Dublin, for sponsoring the podcast. And for you, for all watching and listening, keep the faith and tune in again. Yeah.